Welcome everyone. We're just going to wait until we feel like most people have arrived and then we'll do our introductions. All right, I want to welcome everybody. My name is Martha Painter. I'm a research scholar at the Health Law Institute, and it's my great pleasure to get to moderate today's session. Before we begin, I want to acknowledge that we are on the unceded, unsurrendered land of the Mi'kmaq here at uh, Dalhousie University, where um, the Health Law Institute is located. And I'll let Alex do their own um, land acknowledgement for where they are. This is the first of the Health Law Seminars for 2022. Our theme is a flourishing recovery with justice and equity. Um, and I want to let everyone know that the session today is being recorded. Alex will speak for about 40 minutes and then we'll have questions for about 20 minutes. You can type your questions into the um, Q&A, into the chat, and we'll respond to them that way. There is live captioning available. You should see the link to that in the chat. And now I just want to introduce uh, Dr. Alexander McClelland, who is an assistant professor at the Institute of Criminology and Criminal Justice at Carleton University. From 2019 to 2020, he was a Banting postdoctoral fellow at the University of Ottawa in the Department of Criminology. His work focuses on the intersection of life, law, and disease, where he has developed a range of collaborative and interdisciplinary projects to address issues of criminalization, sexual autonomy, surveillance, drug liberation, and the construction of knowledge on HIV. He is a member of the HIV Justice Network Global Advisory Panel. We are so pleased to have you here today, Alex, and I'll give you the floor now. Thank you so much, Martha, for the generous introduction. I'm so excited to have this conversation with you. Um, and thank you, Adelina, and thank you everyone at the Health Law Institute at Dalhousie. Um, I'm coming to you from the unceded traditional territory of the Al Al Algonquin in Ottawa. Um, and uh, I am going to talk to you today about some of my work in relation to policing pandemics. So what I'm going to do is share a, um, my screen. I'm not a giant PowerPoint person, but I made a fancy PowerPoint for you today. So hopefully it works. Um, bear with me. Um, that should, hopefully you're just seeing the slide. Um, and so um, I'm going to talk to you today about policing pandemics um, and some of my diverse work in relation to that. Um, just a little overview of what I plan on talking about today. I'm going to give a little introduction of who I am, why I'm talking to you all about this, a little bit about my work. I wanted to uh, just briefly kind of define what I mean by policing. You know, for policing scholars, policing means a very specific thing. Um, for uh, criminologists, policing might be understood more broadly. I'll define it for what I mean. Um, then I wanted to tell three stories. Um, one, looking to the past from how people responded, how Canada at a, in an early, as an early, early state, early colonial nation state responded to syphilis, the syphilis pandemic or epidemic, um, how we responded to HIV, and then look today for uh, some kind of uh, uh, anecdotes on how we responded to COVID. And when doing this, I want to be really clear that I'm not saying there's any commonalities or similarities between the infections themselves. I'm really looking at uh, how we have responded uh, using forms of police and enforcement and law to these very different and divergent diseases. And from these three stories, I am hoping to share five kind of general lessons that I think are just interesting for us to move forward um, in understanding policing and pandemics. <clears throat> so that's a little bit of an overview today. So I am uh, a public and critical criminologist. 
Uh, primarily, I do uh, qualitative research, and I was actually asked if I could share a specific paper um, today on my research in relation to policing pandemics. I don't have one specific paper, but throughout, I'm gonna do a bit of shameless self-promotion, apologies, but sharing uh, some of my diverse work in relation to this issue so that you can uh, read it, share it, find it, that kind of thing. And so there's not one unique paper about this issue that I've written about, but a whole bunch of different things. And so um, my, uh, my dissertation research, which I completed at um, Concordia University, uh, was looking at the lived experiences of people who were criminalized due to allegedly not disclosing their HIV status to sex partners. Um, I examined their firsthand experiences, people who had been criminalized, um, people who are registered as sex offenders, people who only had their stories told through a dichotomous narrative of victim of perpetrator, victim and perpetrator, and whose stories and narratives were often erased, and only the dominant understandings of their experience were told through the narratives of the criminal justice system and police. Um, and co courts and media. And so I uh, worked on documenting people's experiences themselves to highlight the nuances and complexities of their experience. Um, out of that work, when COVID hit, I started to be really concerned because um, all of the people I experienced or I talked to in my HIV criminalization research um, actually had felt victimized by the criminal justice system themselves. They often didn't feel like they had done anything wrong and their ex uh, and um, that their understand their experience was misunderstood, that their their the understanding of risk was hyped up and um, uneducated police officers in court who didn't understand how um, in the how HIV worked. Um, uh, amplified risk due to fear and hysteria and ignorance. Um, and so when COVID came about, I started being quite concerned that uh, ongoing dis uh, racist patterns of policing and um, the ways in which marginalized and, and people who are made to have been socially marginalized and oppressed are always targets of, of police, specifically in the context of one we've seen in the past with HIV and with syphilis. In the context of COVID, I became quite concerned that the same thing would happen. And so I started this project with my colleague, the Policing the Pandemic Mapping Project, where we started taking uh, media uh, sources and placing them on a map um, across Canada so we could kind of understand how and why or how policing of COVID was manifesting um, and how uh, forms of enforcement were operating. The project ended um, last year. Um, we captured a number of different waves of the pandemic or no, sorry, the project ended this year and um, or no, last year, it's 2022. Jesus, time moves in a weird, weirdly. Um, but yes, we ended in 2021. We did one full year of the pandemic and then it became actually really, really challenging to get accurate information on forms of enforcement. It was not really in the media anymore. Um, and governments themselves were not really collecting ac ac accurate information in the way that we could kind of do anything with. So we've transformed the project slightly, but there still is a really solid record in here across Canada of the first year of, of COVID enforcement. Um, pretty confident we've documented most instances um, and there's also uh, it's mapped onto this map and then we also have a database um, part of the project really was not to um not to question public health regulations necessarily um, we are i am pro public health i am pro us following uh, appropriate public health guidance that's grounded in human rights but i uh, wanted to put into question the role of police in this context and how police have been placed as central actors in responding to uh, the pandemic. And so part of what we did was we really did a lot of public criminology work. We were in the media tons. We calculated the amounts of fines to highlight uh, the disproportionate impact on poor people who were being fined um, and did a lot of work around that. Um, and so I'm coming to you with some of that experience. Um, I'm a critical criminologist, a qualitative researcher, uh, I uh, do some historical work and um, do lots of public criminology on this issue. <clears throat> so what do I mean by policing? So I use a really broad, when looking at policing of the pandemic, I use a really broad term, um, a really broad definition inspired by the work of J.P. Uh, Brodeur, um, who looks at the police assemblage and how police is a plural enterprise. 
in which many different agents from different, different uh, public institutions and also the private sector can collaborate together. Um, Brodeur also outlines that police um, can be mobilized as a, a policing can be mobilized as an adjective as a verb sorry and um, and that there also can be a whole range of various different specialized administrative policing agencies so it's we're talking not just about the police in uniforms or um, or police departments here. I'm talking about policing in a very broad sense in which a range of different actors are employed or together to work in concert, sometimes collaboratively, sometimes not. And so um, this might involve public health actors, might involve um, people in the media, might involve uh, community-based organization institution actors, a um, whole bunch of different range of actors, and also private security guards in the context of COVID. For example, in Manitoba, it's a private security force who is uh, enforcing COVID, um, and also in many places, uh, for example, in COVID as well, um, uh, People, bylaw officers have been uh, tasked with enforcing COVID. So bylaw officers are policing as well. Um, they police aspects of the, the street and public space already. But um, so just really using a broad notion of policing and understanding this policing, policing assemblage um, that uh, Brodeur uh, talks about. So uh, that's just kind of to define policing. Um, I'm gonna tell three stories now. Hopefully I can kind of power through them. I love all the details of these stories. I won't touch on all of them, but uh, I just want to kind of get them to give us, or use these stories to give us some context for the lessons that I wanna bring forth. And I find it really helpful. Um, it's a, a critical criminology approach to look to the past, doing a history of the present, look to the past to understand our present context. And so I find looking to the past often really helpful for understanding where we're at and where we ended up being and why police are so central in uh, disease uh, control responses. <clears throat> so the first story I wanna tell is about uh, an 18 year old named Eleanor Patterson. Um, who was detained in Fort Saskatchewan Goal, which is still Fort Saskatchewan um, institution uh, in um, Alberta. And she was detained, one of the first people detained under the new Alberta Venereal Disease Prevention Act um, for having syphilis and gonorrhea. And this was around a time when there was a massive and growing syphilis epidemic across Canada. Um, over six or over 66,000 um, cases in the army were documented and in, 19, in 1916 and in 1917 at Toronto General Hospital there was around 13% of all patients um, had uh, an active case of syphilis and um, some uh, statisticians at the time extrapolated that number to replicate to be uh, the whole city of Toronto had a rate of syphilis around that high. Um, and so there was a massive syphilis epidemic happening across Canada. This was a disease that people did not talk about and were very terrified about talking about. Uh, there was a lot of stigma around it. And so there was a whole kind of coordinated range of legislation that was enacted at the same time. So this one, this one, um, this new venereal disease legislation that was passed that in helped incarcerate and detain Eleanor Patterson was part of a coordinated response across Canada that also included the uh, introduction of a provision in the criminal code, which ended up being repealed in 1985. But there was a whole bunch of other provinces that enacted similar, similar legislation. And this legislation um, <clears throat> allowed for the uh, forced, um, forced testing um, detention if tested positive um, and incarceration in jail until you and, and forced treatment until you were um, uh, until you were cured. And interestingly here, this is a complaint form, which is what a judge would fill out for whoever's charges they had to um, for whatever charge you had in court. Um, and so the judge at the time who is uh, was Emily Murphy, who was a famous um, feminist uh, part of the famous five. Um, the judge at the time, instead of writing, say, for example, was charged, uh, was did uh, a burglary or an assault or whatever, the judge at the time indicated that the offense was just that Eleanor Patterson was infected with venereal disease under the venereal disease legislation. Um, and 
this is quite interesting because it conflated viral infection with criminality and she crossed out what the charge was and said just was infected with, which is quite interesting to think about and the consequences of that codifying infection into criminal law um, and uh, into a, a, a common law criminal law proceeding. And so um, what was also interesting at the time was the project of public health itself was a very new invention. And so there was very limited public health infrastructure. There weren't clinics, there was a small number of hospitals and people were very terrified of venereal disease. So what they did was rely on criminal justice infrastructure. This was the early days of public health and the uh, initial reliance was on courts and jails to address criminal uh, to address the venereal disease. And so this law was instituted, uh, which enabled the um, incarceration of people who tested positive for venereal disease to keep them away from the rest of society. <clears throat> um, just really quickly, this is just kind of an interesting side note uh, about this case of um, uh, uh, Eleanor Patterson. This is actually a letter she wrote while incarcerated um, from, uh, from jail while she was incarcerated. And you can see at the top that it's kind of a reprinted letter by Emily Murphy, who states that she was committed for having syphilis and gonorrhea and classes at her name. But interestingly, because she was incarcerated, this letter outlines um, that she had, um, she uh, suffered a lot of social isolation because of being incarcerated and being held in prison meant that she felt that she um, was facing a form of punishment for her behavior as well as a coercive public health measure. So her incarceration was not solely about curing her of venereal disease, it was also about remedying the morally repugnant behavior that led her to her infection in the first place. Um, they were targeting young, um, vagrant women um, who were often single, um, often sex workers. Um, and uh, so there was the, uh, the act of incarcerating someone within the criminal justice infrastructure enabled a dichotomous narrative of victim and perpetrator and wrong, morally, moral wrongdoing. Um, and so this was also just a really interesting case because if you're a lawyer, uh, it betrayed habeas corpus, this, this act of detaining someone without a trial um, against their will um, where there was no trial or actually no real charge uh, betrayed habeas corpus. And this is a letter that Emily Murphy wrote where she was saying that this is a test case. It was kind of sketchy. She was gonna see if she could move forward with it. And defense lawyers at the time contested these cases often believing that the men were equally as responsible for their infections. And one stated in court, it takes two to have sexual intercourse. Are you a decent man to the man who was uh, complaining against a woman who was going to be incarcerated? Um, many of the women who were incarcerated um, were, as I mentioned, sex workers, single working class and indigenous women. They were often targets. And Emily Murphy at the time, who was um, uh, recorded herself at, of charging alone uh, in one year, 75 cases and 66 cases the next year. Um, and so in a local, and what happened was the a local prison population tripled. So as a result of this among women, as a result of this legislation, prior to this legislation, there was around 20, 20 women in the Fort Saskatchewan goal, goal. And after this legislation, you can see the number skyrocketed. Um, and so it actually became a concern because there was no other place to put these women. And Emily Murphy started questioning her approach of incarcerating women uh, for venereal disease and publicly came out and said, there's no place of refuge for girls over 16 to have, um, to have who have made the fatal mistake, their mistake of getting venereal disease, except the jail. And she actually started calling for another um, institution because the jail wasn't working. Women were still getting infected. Women were still getting incarcerated. Um, <clears throat> and it wasn't successful. Indeed, the only thing that abated the uh, massive syphilis epidemic was the introduction of penicillin in 1943. Um, and so this incarcerating approach was actually a complete failure and ended up uh, stopping um, and the uh, introduction of effective, uh, uh, effective medication and prevention 
um, as a result um, was the thing that addressed or ended uh, the syphilis epidemic in Canada, not incarcerating and targeting young women. But this just gives us insight into one of kind of the first uh, proto responses to uh, one of Canada's first uh, epidemics or pandemics and, and uh, health challenges and how people responded. So I'll move on quickly to um, the second case study, uh, the second story that I want to tell. And so this is a story of a tear gas case. So fast forward to 1987. Um, and so George Smith, a founding member of AIDS Action Now, um, a group that I've been part of for quite a number of years, Canada's answer to ACT UP, which was formed actually in 1987, um, wrote an article in a queer periodical where he stated, it looks as though the police in Toronto will continue to shape the politics of, of AIDS in this city for some time to come. And what he was referring to was an incident where Toronto police services were responding to a complaint of a man who looked visibly ill um, and was gay, who was wandering around um, Toronto's East Gay Village um, and making a public disturbance. It was concerned, people were concerned that he had AIDS and had dementia. Um, this was at a time before um, available antiretroviral medications and where there was a lot of AIDS related panic. And so police uh, went to his house, knocked on his door. He was home alone and they shot tear gas into his house um, <clears throat> and um, tried him, tied him to a gurney and arrested him under um, mental health legislation in the province and detained him. Um, the uh, case got a lot of public outcry. Um, there was a lot of constant contestation about calling on police about misuse of force, police perpetrating disease panic, lack of police training on health issues. Um, and one psychiatrist from uh, the Toronto General Hospital wrote a letter to the Toronto Star, um, tear gas on AIDS victim unjustified and said the excessive response by the police was a result of uninformed fear of AIDS contagion. Um, at the time, Toronto Police Services responded and apologized, stating that they would uh, work on education programs for their officers. Um, and what was interesting is uh, a few years later, two years later, after the tear gas, tear gas case, so George Smith, who said police will come to govern responses to AIDS for some years to come, he was correct because some years, only two years later, we started to see an influx of HIV related complaints to police where people started to uh, call the police because uh, they were um, had potentially been exposed to HIV uh, by their sex partner or someone had not allegedly told them they had HIV. Um, and since then, Canada has become uh, one of the leading countries in the world for criminalizing HIV. Uh, non-disclosure, transmission, or exposure with upwards of 200 criminal cases relating to primarily non-disclosure. And the primary targets of this approach are uh, Black migrant men, gay men, Indigenous women, and sex workers. And so um, this tear gas case just kind of gives us an insight into how police respond uh, at times of disease uh, panic where kind of solutions aren't really established yet. Quickly, fast forward 30 years later, <clears throat> in 2017, so that was um, 1987, in 2017, Toronto Police Services are videoed tasering a Black man in downtown Toronto in the middle of the street. He had allegedly kicked a car and spit at um, police. Police were videoed saying to onlookers, watch out, he's gonna spit in your face, you're gonna get AIDS. They again faced public critique for excessive use of force, for lack of knowledge on HIV because you cannot get HIV from spitting. You can't get AIDS from spitting. You can't get, um, that's not, uh, AIDS isn't a virus that's transmittable at all that way. Uh, HIV is the virus and HIV is not transmittable through saliva. Um, and so Toronto Police Services came out and apologized, uh, said they would institute sensitivity training for police officers. Um, and uh, just as a reminder, 
there are over 65,000 people living with HIV in Canada. And so um, we can think about these, this, this story of the tear gas case and the apology and the sensitivity training and look at today or a couple of years ago and think about whether institutions like policing can change and whether such kind of training actually does anything. Um, that's kind of an interesting reflection over time. And so that is uh, the tear gas case. I'll tell one other story, which is a group of little stories and then I'm gonna get into some lessons. So um, the next one is a few little kind of anecdotes. It's not one specific story, but a few little anecdotes about homelessness and COVID. And so the first one is about Ontario's Emergency Management and Civil Protection Act, which introduced a whole range of rules on physical distancing, on self-isolation, on non-essential businesses, it also enabled legalized carding, which was quite controversial, um, asking anyone for ID in public. And it also enabled for a short period of time, the sharing of all COVID positive data with police. And so this is the provision that allowed for that sharing um, <clears throat> of data. And this happened in April of uh, 2020. So the order allowed for the sharing of an individual's name, address, birth date, and whether they had a COVID positive test. Um, and they it specified specific specified custodians, excuse me, such as laboratory or public health per, per, uh, personnel. Um, and they were able to share data, sorry, with police officers and staff, firefighters and staff, paramedics and communicable disease communications officers through a specified portal to get access to this data. The interesting thing was that it didn't indicate the date of COVID infection. So the database ended up housing people's names and information even after they had cleared COVID and were no longer infectious. Um, and the other thing that was quite confusing about the purpose of this um, or the purpose of this uh, portal was quite confusing is because everyone should be in engaging with PPE and assuming that anyone they encounter has COVID positive. So it's quite confusing why this provision was enacted. And the same month that it was enacted, there was this uh, thing that happened um, uh, where uh, across the TTC, um, uh this message got dis displayed to all uh which is toronto transit commission uh toronto's uh public transportation system this message got um relayed to broadcast to all ttc bus drivers uh subway drivers and anyone working for the ttc at the time all across toronto stating um all runs in any area of Jane and Alliance, please do not pick up female, black, 40 plus years, identifying information about her clothes, person is homeless and confirmed to be positive of COVID. In addition, note that through the portal, um, it shared data with uh, Ontario Police, uh, or Ontario Provincial Police, 50 municipal police services and nine First Nation police services in Canada. Um, it is not known where this information came from or if it came from that portal. Um, <clears throat> TTC apologized, but it happened at the same time of the launching of the portal. And um, uh, the TTC apologized that they wouldn't do that again, um, wouldn't share public information about someone and identifying information and their COVID status. Um, but um, and the uh, emergency management and civil protection uh, rule was actually repealed shortly after because there was much public outcry, a public letter signed by many social justice organizations in Toronto, um, including Ontario Coalition Against Poverty and Black Lives Matter. And then there was a legal action launched by the Black Legal Action Clinic, um, Aboriginal Legal Services and the HIV uh, Legal Clinic of Ontario, among others. Um, and so the Ontario government backed down. Um, it was revealed shortly after that there was massive abuse of the use of the portal. Um, and there was over 95,000 searches in the database while it was active. Um, much of it, people looking up, a uh, police looking up people in their neighborhoods, police looking up ex-girlfriends, police looking up relatives, that kind of thing. Um, 
And, uh, but one of the first people we see attacked by this betrayal of, of privacy is uh, a black homeless woman who wanted to get on the subway to get somewhere. Um, and remember, this is prior to um, having access to um, vaccines, because <clears throat> this was last year, um, or the beginning of the pandemic. And so what we see next is even more attacks on homeless people, um, massive fines enacted across Canada, um, and many people, uh, many homeless people targeted by those fines, um, uh, and many homeless people um, targeted for not physically distancing um, and were issued tickets of almost $1,000 all across Ontario, across Montreal and other places as well. And then um, what we all have come to see these images of and all know very well probably uh, is uh, the ways in which then homeless people who sought, to, who sought refuge and protection from congregate settings, from services they were barred from, um, from uh, congregate settings where there was not a appropriate PPE and people taking um, their safety into their own hands in the best way they know how, built houses in um, public spaces. And those public, those houses uh, were destroyed by militarized, militarized police forces um, in extremely violent and harsh ways which were on display um, publicly and millions of dollars were spent to displace people who often ended up in a park just down the street. And so here's another image of that. And so three kind of different divergent stories. We have the story of Eleanor Patterson who was incarcerated because she was infected with venereal disease, venereal disease, uh, sexually transmitted infection I, of syphilis and gonorrhea. Um, often, uh, one thing I didn't note is uh, women who were incarcerated at that time were forced, uh, were put under forced treatment. Forced treatment at the time was um, arsenic injections and a mercury rub for the wounds. So often people would go into toxic shock um, and uh, die um, as a result of the forced medication. Um, but we have that experience, uh, which was enabled as a potentially sketchy but legal process, which betrayed habeas corpus to detain people who were considered infectious and dangerous. Um, we have the tear gassing of a gay man who was experiencing dementia um, uh, because, police, because of police hysteria who trumped up and amplified his, uh, the risk associated with engaging with him. And we have the um, breaching of privacy and the sharing of uh, public health information or, or actually, sorry, not public health information. We have the sharing of uh, sensitive private health information publicly where healthcare information gets translated into other realms to act as a, uh, or act in the service of enforcement. Um, and we also have, we also see through all of this that socially marginalized people come to be the targets of these responses. And so some lessons, um, just kind of sketching the surface of some things that I think we can reflect on in relation to these three different experiences are during times of disease crisis, decision makers and policy actors will rely on policing and criminal justice infrastructure. And indeed the two have been intertwined since the inception of public health. The inception of public health is deeply rooted in and dependent on the criminal justice system for its workings and has been since its inception. So I think that's something to note and think through um, when we think of making distinctions between public health and the criminal justice system. If we look to the past and understand Eleanor Patterson's case, the criminal justice system and public health infrastructure were one and the same. <clears throat> And so um, this is an unfortunate, this lesson is just an unfortunate reality. Um, and uh, one of the consequences is that um, relying on the criminal justice system infrastructure and forms of policing is that we 
how we uh, employ the logic of that institution, um, a logic of wrongdoing, a punitive and carceral logic, which is often ca ca caught up with notions of morality and notions of wrongdoing. And it falls into this individualizing victim versus perpetrator logic of the criminal justice system to respond to something that is a collective and community phenomenon, not an individualizing phenomenon. And so that's kind of one of the consequences of, um, of this unfortunate outcome or this unfortunate reality for lesson one. Lesson two is that pandemic policing blurs what we think are institutional lines between police, actual police and public health actors. Um, and in this line blurring, there's a mission creep that takes place and we see the policification of social problems, of social, of social issues. So um, police come to be the uh, primary and sole actor for addressing a whole range of social problems that should be held by other people. Um, one of the consequences of this is that actual police are trained police in uniforms are trained to respond to social problems with force, force being a word for violence, um, and actual police have lay knowledge of infection transmission, disease containment, how infections and transmission, how tra uh, transmission of diseases works, um, yet they are deputized as one of the front, front line of, of the response. Um, private and health sensitive health information can be translated across institutions when there's this blurring of the lines um, and used for other purposes for them for what it was collected or intended such as enforcement so information about someone's health care could be taken out of context and used um, to enact um, enforcement or um, against them and there's very big consequences for that we see that in the criminalization of hiv where people's medical files are are subpoenaed and used in court against them and so that puts people in a precarious context with their health care providers <clears throat> um, and when a public health risk or a health related risk comes to be translated into by police into a risk the um the, that risk can be amplified, it can be heightened, it can be misunderstood, it can be lead, lead to greater violence, like we see with um, the tasering and the um, uh, tear gassing of uh, those two individuals. Um, they uh, received more intense responses from police because there was a risk that they also had a disease as well as being just a general nuisance or causing a problem in public. Um, and in the context of COVID, we've had a lot of talk about togetherness, working together across Canada and empathy and um, how we need to all be working together in this. But policing pandemics actually works at cross purposes for a strong collective response that's rooted in ethics or care, an ethics of care um, or any Beth, Beth practices related to public health. So there's this kind of conflicting policy goals that happen here. And so um, to share a few things that I've written in relation to this with wonderful colleagues, if you're interested in um, the sharing of police, uh, sharing of data with police, we've developed a paper on alternative to sharing COVID, COVID positive data with law enforcement recommendations for stakeholders. One of them, if you work in public health, is to decline to share that information do not and not make it possible for police to have access to it. <clears throat> Lesson number three um, is despite um, many appeals by policy actors for pandemic responses to be evidence-based, we see here, here lots and lots of needs for everything to be evidence-based, punitive and policing responses such as fines or incarceration lack any evidence in their effectiveness to address infection transmission. So we see the rollout of fine after fine after fine in the context of COVID. There is no evidence base that those will lead to people changing their behavior. Um, and the evidence that does exist in relation to responding that way uh, with punitive, uh, punitive measures uh, is that those result in forms of violence and social marginalization. <clears throat> So the only thing that had an impact on the syphilis pandemic was not incarceration, it was the development of penicillin. Um, 
HIV itself has only been exacerbated by forms of criminalization um, and public health objectives have been undermined because people are have created, there's a context of fear and uncertainty where people do not go to access services because services are understood as an arm of the criminal justice system, that part of that police assemblage where they will report on people if they tell them things that they're not supposed to. Um, and strong, um, conclusive evidence to support the deterrent effectiveness is fine, of fines is also lacking in many contexts. If you look at um, drunk driving, for example, or speeding, um, there's very there's evidence that shows the higher the fine, high, raising fines higher doesn't stop people from speeding or drunk driving, um, and that fines in general don't deter that behavior, and um, and so it is not. Uh, we don't have, uh, and we have no data on the use of fines in the context of a pandemic to deter people from doing things we don't want them to do or to encourage people to do things we don't want to do. So there is not an evidence base here about these responses. Um, such responses are based on retribution. They are based on forms of violent deterrence, and they are only evidenced at promoting stigma forms of discrimination, creating contexts of fear and uncertainty and precarity and lack of security and violence. <clears throat> and again, conflicting policy goals. So here's two little pieces uh, out of the Policing the Pandemic project. We did some public criminology work highlighting the lack of evidence base on fines and that fines are will only uh, result in a burden um, on uh, socially marginalized people and poor people um, who don't have the ability to pay thousand dollar fines. Um, there's also a lot of work uh, happening contesting the constitu constitutionality of the use of fines in the context of COVID, um, but here we've developed a report outlining the lack of evidence base and conflicting policy goals in relation to the use of fines in the context of COVID. And also here is a paper uh, in the Canadian Journal of Public Health outlining with a number of wonderful colleagues um, who primarily work on HIV, who have translated their work on human, human rights-based HIV responses to the context of COVID. And we outlined some general principles on grounding COVID responses in human rights. Lesson four, and then there's one more. Um, lesson after this is that socially marginalized people will bear the brunt of punitive responses. Existing in unequal patterns of enforcement will just be reproduced. Um, people who are already considered risky by public health, will that risk will be amplified in the context of pandemics, um, and they will be targets of increased surveillance um, and increased punitive responses. And here is it important, it is always important for us to ask, or I, important for me to ask, and this is the question I always ask, I get my students to ask, and I get um, communities I work with to ask. Um, when we're talking about public health, we have to ask the question, whose health and who is the public? And often, for example, in the context of uh, the syphilis epidemic, Eleanor Patterson was not the public. She was considered a risk that the public had to be protected from. That man who was tear gassed was not considered a member of the public. He was considered a risk that the public had to be protected from and contained under violent circumstances and the use of tear gas. Um, homeless people are not considered the public and public health. Uh, when we look at how we are responding to uh, encampments and how that woman was barred from accessing the TTC because of fears around um, infection. And so um, uh, always ask in the context of public health responses, who is the public and whose health? And socially marginalized people are never considered the public in public health. And in order to reorient our thinking, public health has to do really big work internally to figure itself out, to stop paternalizing logic, stop targeting specific communities the ways that it does, and start working to address uh, responses that value all members of society. <clears throat> and so um, 
we, I wrote a paper with a couple of friends of mine looking at colleagues of mine um, at the American Journal of Public Health, looking at a research agenda for researchers who in public health, looking at examining uh, HIV and uh, COVID and criminalization. And we laid out a short research plan that said that research in this area must attend to issues of racism and the racist patterns of policing and public health surveillance. Um, but that we also might, must really understand, do more work to understand how police and public health operate and work together. A lot of it's a black box. We don't know how these things happen. Um, and we as social scientists need to do a better job of understanding how these surveillance systems work, how the work of public health practitioners and police happens in concert, and what are the consequences so that we can put that stuff into question. Lastly, my last question here, um, and I'm getting up to the 40-ish minute mark, so I'll wrap up in time. Um, lesson number five, there have always been resistance and debate to the use of police um, and the application of punitive responses to respond to communicable diseases. This is not a given. While it is, uh, unfortunately, police have been cemented as um, central actors in responses to pandemics, um, there is constant debate um, and it is constantly contested and we need to keep that up. And so if we look back to the uh, uh, 1919 and 1920, in 1920, the architect of putting women in jail, Emily Murphy, who worked a lot with Gordon Bates, who was a public health uh, doctor, who was actually one of the founding members of the Canadian Public Health Association and the Canadian Journal of Public Health, um, who also worked on with this on her. They became concerned about putting women in jail after a while for syphilis and actually outlined that there was a disproportionate incarceration rate of women between women and men in relation to these um, into in in this approach and they themselves thought it was causing more harm than good and started to work on ways to move forward um, uh, and also interestingly uh, the criminal code provision which they helped introduce which uh, criminalized reckless um, transmission of syphilis and gonorrhea and herpes um, was repealed from the criminal code in 1985 because at the time, politicians thought there should be no criminal code provision around a public health issue. There should be something that's dealt with not by the criminal courts, um, but by public health actors. Um, also in relation to HIV criminalization, this, uh, this issue is very much in flux and in reform. Uh, Jody Wilson Weibold, former Minister of Health, uh, outlined in 2017 that there was a concern of the over-criminalization of HIV um, and feds and some provinces have now changed their response um, and will not prosecute if someone is virally suppressed or undetectable. That has created concerns, of course, for who is <clears throat> uh, people who are not virally suppressed can still be subject to the criminal law and that has created a dividing line and often people who aren't on medication are more socially mar made to be more socially marginalized people who have been released from prison people who are non status people who don't have a house to live in. Um, or a fixed address um, often may not be on medication. And so they could be in a more precarious state as a result of that. But what these reforms have done is dramatically reduce the people, the amount of people that are entering the criminal justice system in relation to complaints due to um, HIV, alleged HIV non-disclosure. And so that has happened and that has been due to massive advocacy on behalf of hundreds of people across Canada, legal experts, human rights experts, people living with HIV have been relentless in their pushing of the government to change that. So that has been constantly contested. Um, the law enabling COVID positive data sharing was rescinded after much public outcry and a legal challenge. And there's been a widespread debate around the policing of homelessness in the context of COVID. And so these are not givens. These are things that are um, constantly contested. And I think that's really important for us to keep pushing if we're someone who thinks that uh, the role of police in, the pan in a pandemic or in managing disease needs to be put further into question. So we need to keep doing all of this work. <clears throat> um, finally, I just wanted to show uh, these two pictures. This is a picture from a 
venereal disease hall of fame of women who uh, are were infected with venereal disease during World War II, put up in a military barracks in Canada. Um, and this next to where for so soldiers would not have sex with those women, I guess. Um, and then this is a picture from a two, couple years ago from Vancouver of a police manhunt for this man, David Hind, who was living with HIV, who was alleged to not be taking his HIV medications. And the consequence from um, public health actors was to call the police, put his name in the media and enact a full on manhunt to search for him. Um, and harkens back to kind of very similar uh, approaches from back in the day of publicly shaming and putting people's headshots out into the world. Um, so there we have five lessons on uh, policing pandemics, three kind of divergent stories. And um, I would be happy to have a conversation and talk more with you about all of this. That's how you can reach me. Thank you so much, Alex. What a fascinating and infuriating presentation. I wanted to get us started. You, you leave on the note of um, the, the policing of COVID positive people. And just two days ago, there was a poll because uh, we are now in the vaccine era, right? And there was a poll uh, showing that 27% of respondents in Canada believe that people who remain unvaccinated should be jailed. Uh, vis-a-vis -vis the outbreaks in jails, vis-a-vis -vis the problems we've had with uh, encouraging vaccination in jails because of the abuse that prisoners have experienced. Um, so where do you see in the vaccine era uh, the policing of COVID? How is it going to be manifesting? It's quite interesting. I don't have a solid answer for you on this, but one of the things that I have been um, in, in just kind of reference think or thinking back to HIV. Um, one of the things that's quite interesting is now we have injectable PrEP, um, which is something that's been coming for quite some time, which is uh, injectable prophylactics, which can prevent HIV, trans, uh, HIV transmission if someone um, has sex with someone else. And uh, injectable PrEP is being treated on prisoners. So they're in the US and has been given to prisoners in the US against their will where they are injected every month with it. And so that they just won't get, um, whether it doesn't address any of the social, social context of why someone might be at risk for HIV, but it just stops them from getting it against their will. Um, and I, the, the uh, anti-vax situation is so complicated. I have no answers for anyone on that, but I think that I think we have to think always about bodily autonomy and human rights and putting people in jail in this context is never the right solution, specifically when jails are uh, jails or prisons are super hubs of infection. <laughs> and so that's obviously the wrong social response. Um, but interestingly, if you do, it's all about how you do also ask questions. So for example, if I go around without explaining all of my research on the harms of criminalizing people due to HIV, if I go around and I say, oh, should someone who doesn't tell their sex partner uh, that they have HIV go to jail, yes or no, and I don't answer, don't provide any other context, people have done the, that research. It's shoddy research, but they've done that research and we get horrible statistics that say a majority of the general population thinks people living with HIV should go to jail. What you don't hear are uh, that women living with HIV who are sexually assaulted by their partners are the ones who end up and who didn't use a condom are the ones who end up in jail and are the ones who end up registered as sex offenders. You don't hear the ways in which those people when they're incarcerated are assaulted on a daily basis by the rest of the prison population under the watch of guards because the guards share their health information with everyone um, in the prison against the law. Um, and what you don't hear is about is um, all of the various ways in which people actually tried to protect their sex partner and do the right thing, but that was taken out of context or the nuance was erased because once they entered the criminal justice system, 
you enter this dichotomous logic of victim and perpetrator, there's no room for any nuance. So even when a person had told their partner, if their partner went to the police, that partner was believed over the HIV positive person. And so um, entering anything into the realm of should this be a criminal justice system issue erases any complexity. It's a giant hammer that just flattens any complexity or nuance to these issues where often we need much more complex, um, empathetic um, and empathetic supports for people to understand where they're at and what they're doing. So doesn't answer that question, but it gives you some context as to why I, I can't answer that question. <laughs> it's, it's a great answer. Um, and kind of following on that, uh, Constance, uh, Dr. Constance McIntosh from the Institute has asked, do you think that the defund the police slash retask the police movement might change the story going forward? And I, I don't know, Alex, if you're familiar, but we just last week had um, the defining defunding the police report launched here in Halifax. So it's really top of everyone's minds um, and a great read if you haven't uh, had a chance to read it yet. So I'll, I'll let, let you respond to Constance. Yeah, thank you, Constance. Really wonderful report. I have not read all of it. It's quite long, but congrats to Elle Jones and all the people who are leading that report and excellent, excellent work. Um, and um, uh, one of the things I would like people to consider who are working in the defund the police movement is to um, not default to uh, just like, oh, something's a public health issue. We should just make this a public health. Well, this should no longer be under the purview of, of police. One of the things I try and talk about is the porous and intertwining nature of social institutions. And uh, that, um, uh, for example, just relying on social workers or just relying on nurses isn't going to solve your problem because public health nurses and public health departments have acted like police and are a form of police. Um, and so uh, defunding the police will end a certain forms of violence in society, but um, uh, could result in a diversification of uh of problems for um, the ways in which we deal with other social issues. So I think there needs to be a broader think around the within the defund the police movement to defund carceral and coercive institutions, which uh, result in oppression. And so if you're someone living with HIV or um, uh, you'll know that uh, public health institutions often don't have your back. They treat you like you are essentially parapathological on the verge of committing a crime at any time. You're under suspicion and under surveillance and essentially act as a form of police over your life. And so um, defunding the police will do one thing, but it could bolster and give more power to institutions uh, that already act in a policing way using a, the logic of the criminal justice system even further. So wonderful, amazing work just needs to be expanded to look at other social institutions. As a nurse, I really appreciate that response and agree with you very strongly. Uh, the next question is, do you have any comments on the lack slash underfunding of public health officers uh, that is usually four to six years training and assessment slash response throughout the course of the pandemic? Um, so yeah, I guess the, um, Heather Young yeah. asks that about our funding of public health. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think I, I'm quite concerned about public health, uh, the way in which public health, I mean, you know, public health, the, the ways in which public health operates is different in every province, highly decentralized. In Ontario, we have 34 different health units. Each health unit is governed by one specific medical officer of health who's essential, essentially whatever that medical officer of health states can become law. And the, um, the oversight in relation to what they say um, is quite limited. Uh, criminal law, for example, you have a court, you might have a judge and maybe even a jury. Um, in, uh, uh, and there's evidentiary requirements and certain uh, rules of evidence that you have to follow. In the context of uh, uh, public health legislation, it's really the word of the of the um, medical officer of health that is law and there's less, the bar is lower for evidentiary requirements and there's less oversight. There's no jury or anything. Um, and often there's no sunset clause. So these uh, public health orders can just 
it be issued forever and don't go away, um, depending on which province you're in, and uh, can cause a lot of harm in people's lives. So actually, um, I'm not sure if more funding of that same process, that same that same approach would work. I think maybe a rethinking of that approach needs to happen. For example, um, Richard Shabus, who uh, is uh, no longer with us, but he was working as a medical officer of health in Ontario up until just a number of years ago and had been since the 1990s. And in 1989, he called for the full on quarantine of people living with HIV and he when he was the medical officer of health of Toronto and he publicly called for HIV to be labeled a virulent disease which, which would mandate all people living with HIV to be quarantined. There was the one of the largest AIDS Action Now demonstrations to counter his calls happened. Um, he was actually, uh, they called for him to resign. He didn't resign. He was just moved to Prince Edward County and continued to operate as a medical officer of health in the province for many, many years. Um, and so uh, when we're dealing with one specific person's point of view and what that point, person's point of view is, uh, it doesn't have a lot of oversight or is not able to be contested because what they say is the law, that's a problem. So I think we need to rethink, not more funding necessarily, but rethink approaches to how we address public health issues. Sort of related to that in, in terms of a, uh, a tools of public health, Sean Harmon, who's also from the Institute asks, it's incredible that they could achieve any sort of effective data sharing and a common or central portal relating to the COVID data when we cannot even efficiently or effectively share vaccine status data across health platforms in routine settings. Many of us have been calling for a national vaccine registry linked to electronic health records so relevant epidemiologic data can be brought to bear in decision making and treatment. Based on your research, what are the dangers of such a tool and do they outweigh the benefits? How do we avoid its misuse in the ways that you have described? Um, yeah, I think there is off, off like, there's lots of benefits to data sharing, um, but I would ensure that any data like that cannot be shared with police. So you make it interoperable with police databases and you have strong protocols about how that information will, will not be shared, for example, uh, as evidence in a criminal trial um, that people would resist its, its uh, seizure or subpoena if it was going to be, and that there was no access to it for uh, police agencies. And that's what we wrote about in that article I shared. We kind of have six potential alternative steps and kind of pr proposed ways forward, and I would adopt those. Okay, this is probably gonna be our last question. Okay. Uh, Alicia Landers asks, how would you reconcile the constitutional notion of infringing on individual rights for the purpose of protecting public health? while also considering the detrimental effects that these infringements may have on society as a whole. Where should the line be drawn? Yeah, this is a foundational debate in public health. Um, we must, uh, we must, um, it is justified to suspend certain individual rights for the greater good. And this is often um, the thing that I get caught up against is this logic that underwrites a lot of public health uh, practices oh, we don't have to ask anyone for their consent to share their data because sharing their data is, the, is in the benefit of public health. So that outweighs that person's individual rights. Um, we, and this is happening right now in, uh, in many different ways, um, but in, in the context of molecular HIV surveillance, which is a whole other thing I don't need to get into, but um, it's a, it's a sur d d disease surveillance um, uh, approach which is happening in BC and Quebec where people's uh, people's HIV related information is shared uh, secondarily out of a care context for public health purposes without people's consent and it's used to surveil people cre create create uh, understand clusters of infection and risk networks and actually then target interventions at people um, who are labeled as risky and this is all information collected at a health in a healthcare setting and then repurposed for uh, surveillance and um, public health practitioners justify this use of repurposing without consent because of um, the public good and so one of the things i have been working for working on is uh, we have to again reconsider who is the public in public health 
is the betrayal of people living with HIV's rights beneficial to the public if we see the public as public health is creating a sense of precarity and lack of safety and security for a whole sector of society beneficial to the public if those people are they are the public they're taxpayers so what does that do we need to re we need new models of thinking through ethics in public health because the current ones are no longer working specifically in the ways in which big data can mean that all these data sets can be shared more widely we need a new way of thinking about ethics and making ethical decisions in the context of public health because that justification no longer works and it's not an argument that sells for anybody for me anyways um, if you view certain people as risks that need to be managed and not as autonomous actors with dignity that we need to care for and figure out what the issue is if you employ a paternalizing logic that people are objects of risk that you need to intervene in and manage, um, then that's not going to work. It's not working. And what it does is create forms of violence, othering, surveillance, lack of precarity, um, and lack of trust. People do not want to engage with public health institutions because they are not considered the public in public health. They are treated as other. And so in order to actually figure out a response that engages everyone, we need to rethink uh, the logic that underwrites public health. Thank you. That's a fantastic way to close. Really strong. Really glad you could join us, Alex. Uh, incredible work that you're doing. For everyone who's uh, on the Zoom, this session was recorded. So if you didn't quite transcribed verbatim Alex's great quotations you can do so later um, and I want to invite you all to join us um, for our, our next seminar it's going to be on February 11th it's uh, Marina Morrow who will be speaking about realizing human rights and social justice in mental health um, a lot of crossover there with uh, what Alex has been talking about thank you all so much um, yeah. Thank Absolutely you for having later, me, Alex. Martha. So great to talk to you. And thanks everyone at the Health Law Institute. Bye.